This morning, I want to share with you a few words as it relates to We're actually building on a children's chat that I had last week. How many of you were here last week? Okay. A lot of us were here yet. Do you remember the cardboard box I had up here? All right. Home sweet home over the door. Misspelled. (laughs) I want to build on that if I can because I want to start at the beginning and tell you why Jesus used that illustration with such power at the close of the Sermon on the Mount. Because you see, he didn't start by talking about being a master architect, a master builder. He started talking about how do I live life? I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I'm a white-haired old guy. It is what it is. I, I took my grandkids through the Uh, Air Museum down in Tucson this last week during spring break. And I just told him about, well, my first airplane ride was on an airplane like that, and then this one, and then this one, and and here's what this one was like, and I just went through and explained what they were seeing. And when they got done, they said, you made this so much more interesting, because now we know something of how it came to be. And here all I thought I was doing was just telling them what I'd seen and heard. I guess that just makes me an old guy. Or a walking encyclopedia. I'm not sure which. But you get the advantage of seeing, hearing from someone who's seen just about every cycle that you can imagine about life. I've seen every church growth strategy since the 1960s. How many of you were in the bus ministry fad? We just filled school buses and brought them from all over the community and brought them in. We've had church growth strategies that have come and gone and cycled through all kinds of different ways. And each one served their purpose in their own way. Do you know what I found? There are some things that are given. There are some things that are solid that you can count on. And one of the things is that Jesus gave us the ministry we're supposed to have. Here's what he said. Now, I'm not going to do this. It's, it's not going to come up on the screen or anything. I just want to... Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And here was his sermon text. Listen carefully. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What were they repenting of? Were they bad people? Were they evil? Hadn't they lived up to what God's law had told them to do? Why would they need to repent? Why is that so difficult to try and get people to understand? I went back and reviewed a little bit. When I was growing up, there was a thing called the Dale Carnegie Program. How many of you ever heard of Dale Carnegie? He had tremendous impact throughout the community, around the, around the world, because they tried to say, how can you make friends and influence people? And it was this wonderful technique that you could use to try and get people to do what you wanted them to do. It was a manipulation. It was a pure and bold-faced, absolutely, set it right out in the open. How can I get people to do what I want them to do? You know what I've always known down underneath? You know what Dale Carnegie knew? He understood that people are a great big wad of messed up attitudes, misconceptions, prejudgments, 
bigoted thoughts and ideas, all kinds of miscalculations and deeply held passions. And somehow we have to hook into that if we want people to get them to do what we want them to do. You don't have to read the newspaper like we did yesterday and there, you know, all these different Russian uh, people who were gathering information uh, to try and get us hooked to hear what we want to hear. Dale Carnegie knew that we had these unbridled passions inside of us that drew us in all kinds of different directions all the way back in the 60s. He didn't need someone collecting information. How many of you ever fill out one of those little surveys they do online? What kind of animal would you be if you were translated into another animal? What's your favorite, uh, who you're going to become back as, as the actress or actor that you're most closely associated with? What kind of dinosaur would you be if you were translated into being a dinosaur? All those things are designed to get enough information about you that they can send stuff to keep you feeding your passions and your preconceived ideas. It's all manipulation. It's all salesmanship. It's all Dale Carnegie. You know what? Jesus said, why don't we just be honest? Why don't we just say, Father in heaven, I'm sorry I'm such a hot mess. I'm just one mixed up, confused individual. And I don't know how to build a real life. I don't know how to build something that will last. I don't know how to do something to have a major impact in the world. I'm just stumbling along here, making this up as I go. Jesus said, repent. Repent. What do they have to repent for? Turn with me to the Beatitudes. It's chapter 5, Matthew. I'm going to read for you a few verses. <coughs> because this is where he starts. This is the message that leads us to the final parable where he talks about the wise and the foolish builders. Now Jesus saw the crowds and went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who, pers who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Maybe the best way to illustrate this is to tell a story. Many years ago, in a place very far away, I was sitting in a worship service, much like we are here today. It was at a campground in Indiana. It was an annual convention. All the people from all over the state had come. And it was a little tiny chapel. It probably wouldn't even had two sections of seats in here. So they had taken the benches and they'd pushed them really close together, right up to the front of the church, so they have enough room for people even to stand up in the back. I knew about everybody that was there. I'd been a preacher's kid my whole life, married, had my in-laws with me. 
And a man called Stanley Tam was speaking. And Stanley Tam was a layman who had turned over his entire business to the Lord. God owns my business. And Stanley Tam was telling about his journey of faith. And as I heard him talking, and I listened to his voice, there was another voice. It was a voice that spoke down inside of me, and he said, You haven't really let me have your heart. You haven't really let me have control of your life, of your emotions, of your dreams, your aspirations. You haven't really given me first place in your heart. And he said, I think you ought to come up here and make this the day when you let me be the Lord of your life. He whispered that to me. He, he said it in words I could understand. And so I used words to respond to him. Lord, you're crazy. I'm not going up there. There's no altar call at the end of this service. There never is at the annual convention. Come on, everybody here is a Christian. They've been Christians their whole lives. They're representatives of all their whole churches. Didn't stop his voice. He just kept saying it. You know? Today would be a really good day to do this. No, Lord, you don't understand. I know all these people. They will have no idea what I'm coming up for. And they will think I have done terrible things. And I will have really let that. And the questions will fly. And oh, I don't want to do this. But he just kept saying, let me be the Lord. Let me be your Lord and Savior. And you can't do it sitting there. You just can't do it sitting there. You know that. Well, Lord, I'll do it when I get back home to my home church. I argued with him. No, not here, not now, not today. You're still going to be there when I get back home. You know, come on. And the words kept coming. Don't, don't push me away. Don't make up reasons. And I began to get desperate. I'd running out of stuff to say. And I looked over. My father-in-law was sitting right next to me, next to the aisle. And the pews were pushed together real tight. I said, Lord, his knees are so close to the pew in front of him, I couldn't get out. And the Lord laughed at me. He laughed at me out loud. And he said, have you ever heard of anything as dumb as what you just said? I gave Olin Anglin a sharp elbow, and he took off for the aisle, and I went up, and I knelt down. And I poured out my heart. My friends, there's never a time when you feel more whole, more healthy, more alive than when you have claimed the grace and the power of God in your life and surrendered to it. Repent, Jesus said. Repent of what? I was a good person. <laughs> Repent of what? Let me read down through the list. Can I? Would you join with me? Verse 3. Blessed are those who come to me empty-handed. You can read in their poorer spirit if you want to. 
I'm going to say, they don't have a thing in the world to offer me. They come completely without reservation. And what will be their blessing? I will give them the kingdom of heaven. (laughs) Boy, I got it that day. (laughs) I got it that day. I thought I had it figured out. Oh, the world seems to treasure having a firm mind, a confident voice. I've got this. I can handle this. I can do this. It's not a problem. I will overcome. And if I reach a place where I'm blocked or I'm hindered, I'll find a way around it. Is that the way you get the kingdom of heaven? Is that the the way you get the blessing? I thought it was. I've been through the Navy, been through college. I was doing great, fully prepared for life. Blessed are those who come empty handed, blessed are those who mourn because their hearts are broken. broken why would my heart be broken what what's the reason for me to have a broken heart what have I done to be so mournful about that I I would weep because of my failure well let me just ask you of the Ten Commandments which ones do you break most frequently do not steal. How many of you stole something this week? Don't raise your hand. Don't. That was close. <laughs> Don't lie. Don't raise your hand. Don't envy. Don't cuss. That's the 11th one. Which one? Ah. What about the one that says, I have to be God in your life, and you're not. How have have you kept that one? And when we realized, like I did that day, that I really hadn't made him the Lord of my life, I mourned, and the tears flowed. And I wet down the front of my shirt. Because I wasn't the confident, powerful overcomer that I thought I was. And I realized how broken and empty I had been. Blessed are the dispossessed. You ever been homeless? You ever been without an automobile or a a 401k or place to lay your head down at night. Blessed are those who are coming who have lost everything and all they need is God's touch for they will inherit the earth. How do you inherit the earth? Work hard, put your shoulder to the wheel, put your nose to the grindstone. How do you work in that position? I mean, all twisted up. No, it's not by doubling down and working twice as hard. God said, I'm going to give you the entire earth if you simply come to me as someone who claims nothing, as your own. Blessed are those who are starving to death to be right with God. Starving to death to be in harmony with God. For they will be satisfied. You see, if we come feeling like we have already got it figured out, 
If we come to the Lord into a worship service like this and saying, okay, I'm going to worship you, I'm going to praise, I'm going to sing, not real loud, but I'm going to sing a little bit, and I'm going to raise my hand at least as high as my shoulder. Not up here, but it's here. I'm, I'm pretty well together, I'm, I'm okay. He can't do anything for you. But if you're starving to death, if you're dying of thirst to have him in your heart, he can open the floodgates of heaven and satisfy your needs. Blessed are those who are filled with grace. Filled with God's love. Filled with his willingness to be patient and kind and thoughtful of those who are struggling to figure it out on their own. See, the opposite of that is being judgmental and harsh. And it does not say, blessed are those who tell everybody else how they should behave and make a bunch of rules for other people to follow and then try to make them accountable because they don't live up to them. Ooh, boy, I wish it said all that stuff. That'd make my job a lot easier. You know why? Being merciful is hard work. Come on, people. I've been preaching to you for six months. Haven't you got it figured out yet? <laughs> we can giggle about it. Jesus spent three years, and in the last night of his life, he said, people, disciples, my friends, why can't you get it together? And he was a pretty good teacher. And still after three years, they didn't understand it. He was filled with mercy and patience and grace. Blessed are those who are completely, totally dedicated. And I will let them see God. I will let them see my Father in heaven. I will show him to him. You know who aren't pure in heart? This may sound harsh, and I'm sorry about that. But me sitting in that pew that day, I was not pure of heart. You know why? Because I wasn't honest. I wasn't honest with God. I was claiming something that was not mine. I was claiming to be someone who was not me. I was pretending that I was okay. And that's dishonest. It's just plain lying. And you can't call yourself pure of heart if you're trying to fool God into thinking something that's true that isn't. You can't. Jesus said, blessed are those who are totally surrendered and fully dedicated to being God's people. Blessed are those who live in favor with God and with man. <laughs> One of the scriptures that talked about Jesus growing up in his earliest childhood days, and he grew in favor with God and with man. Wouldn't it be cool to have someone you disagreed with completely, had a completely opposite worldview, but you respected so much you said, now there's a person who really knows how to live. Wouldn't that be cool? We don't agree on very much. But I respect and Deeply admire someone who can live with that kind of integrity. Those are peacemakers. They live in favor with God and man. They will be called children of God. What a blessing.
child of God. Blessed are those who are victimized on every hand. I wish I could tell you a fairy tale like we tell our kids at bedtime. And there's a happy ending at the end of the little story and everybody went home and lived forever happy ever after. Remember Cinderella? She went to the ball and she ended up with the prince and went to live in the palace and had a happy life from that point all forward. Everything's cool, right? Not when you follow the Lord. Because sometimes people are going to get so agitated and so angry and so filled with rage, jealousy, envy, hatred, that they're going to say everything in the world to bring you down. I wish I didn't have to tell you the truth. Judy and I have had to live with emergency supplies in the back of our car so in case we were attacked, we could leave town in a hurry. We turned to leave our home and went home for Christmas many years ago, fully believing that when we returned, the only thing standing where all of our whole lives had been invested would be the foundation where they burned the house down. That sound like fun? That sound like a great thing? Everybody in favor of let's just go ahead and follow the Lord and then let people just beat the snot out of us. I have people in my family who were thrown out of their position as pastor having done nothing wrong while their wife was struggling with breast cancer and was thrown off their health insurance and shortened her life because someone hated them. And they were pastors of the church. And they were leaders in the church. And they were administrators within the church. Why would I invite you to do something like that? Why would I ask you to do something as painful as that? As sorrow-filled as that? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. My friends, I'd love to throw the door open to the kingdom of heaven and all of its blessings and all of its joys and all of its grace and all of its love. I'd love for you to build a life that no matter what happened, no matter what disaster fell from the sky, no matter what the economy did or what North Korea or Russia or anybody else does, you are going to have a place that's going to give you faith and you're going to give your family protection and comfort. But I have to be honest with you. I have to ask you first to repent. Repent. No Dale Carnegie story here. No power of positive thinking here. I'm following Jesus Christ. And if he said to the people of his days, first, repent. Realize that you can't come to God with anything to offer. You have to come to him asking to be filled. You need to come to your Father in heaven, asking for his grace so that you can learn how to build that life of stability and hope and faith and confidence. When I was raising my kids, we had cardboard 
boxes decorated to look like bricks. And we had a whole bunch of them in our playroom. And they would put them together into different configurations. They'd build towers with them. They'd build houses. They'd build little forts with them. But you know what? They were built with cardboard. And all it took was the tiniest little touch of someone's toe, and the whole building would fall down. And then I went to work in the stone business. You know something? You kick a stone building, you're going to hurt your toe, because it's there to stay. I've built so many beautiful, beautiful homes out of marble and granite and quartzite. I have built so many beautiful structures that will last for decades because of the way that they are built so strong and solid. But I also live in a mobile home court. And I know that every time it rains hard, somebody's going to lose a mobile home. You know why? They didn't build it right. It's flimsy. Nothing but one step up from a cardboard box. My friends, I offer you the kingdom. I offer you the grace of God. I offer you God's peace, His joy, and His love. And all I ask you to do to claim it is ask God to forgive you for being so filled with yourself, so filled with your own ideas, so filled with your own self-confidence, so filled with your own perception of what life is supposed to be that you miss the chance to see God's kingdom and feel God's smile upon you. Would you join with me in a moment of prayer? Father in heaven, <coughs> I am so thankful. I am so grateful that you sent Stanley Tam to that Indiana conference session and you had him just speak from his heart about how he struggled to make God's will the center of his life, to get past the anger of being frustrated and getting past the fear of what's going to happen the next day and maybe my whole business will collapse around me and what's going to happen if this happens or that happens and and then one day, he realizes it's all in God's hands anyway. Why don't I just deed the whole business over to him? You see, deeding over his business was just a way like we would do today, saying, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my life goals. I give you my dreams and aspirations. I give you my emotions. I pour them all out on the altar before you. And I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've stood in the way so long. Please forgive me. for not loving you as I should. Father in heaven, as we sing our closing song this morning, if there is anyone, Lord, that you're working in their hearts, if there's someone who is calling out to you from their spirit saying, that's what I want, Lord, that's exactly what I want, that's, that's what I need, answer their prayers this morning. Reach out with your hand of love and let your spirit fall upon them. 
Let them know that they are a part of the kingdom of heaven. As you had intended from the beginning, you are the Lord of their lives. Let this be a homecoming Sunday for those who come to you. And you can put your arms around them and say, welcome back, son. Welcome back, daughter. I've loved you every day of your life. Welcome home. Help us, Lord, to feel that victory this morning and to know it in our hearts. And we'll give you the praises in every way. Amen.